Excuse me, everybody. Hello, good morning. Uh, so Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this book talk of the Humanities Across the Borders program. My name is Enrico Joaquin Lapuz. I'm the web content coordinator here at of Humanities Across Borders. So our speaker today is Professor Francoise Bernays, a collaborator of the Humanities Across Borders program. She's been an integral part since the program's inception. So she will speak for about 45 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll have a Q&A portion where everyone here and also online can ask questions. And if you have any questions online, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat field and we'll address them during the Q&A. So to give some opening remarks and to introduce Francois herself, please welcome the director of IAS, Philippe Pekin. So good morning, everybody, and uh, sorry to be dressed up like that. <laughs> we are waiting for a delegation uh, from Indonesia, so uh, to do my 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 job. Uh, here, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> so we okay. So it's a great pleasure for uh, for me and for the institute to uh, receive Professor Françoise Berges. Uh, I said Françoise rather than Professor Françoise Berges. <laughs> Uh, first, because she is uh, very much part of the IS, uh, you know, uh, community. We've been involved for many years together on a number of occasions, including within the framework of what we call Humanities Across Borders, uh, the, the major program that IS has undertaken a few years ago with a number of partners in different parts of the world to rethink the act of uh, knowledge sharing and knowledge dissemination uh, beyond the traditional framework of universities. So uh, if you want more information about this program, my colleague Arti Kolra here is here, and then we have some leaflets on the table. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite, um, I think, um, provocative and yet very necessary uh, uh, effort that is being uh, undertaken by this program. And Francoise has been one of the inspiring persons behind this initiative. The same way today she will question or go beyond the, the, the institutional framework of the museum. Uh, she's been also engaged in, in, in tackling the question of the, 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 the university as, a, as another temple of, of of, uh, of knowledge uh, and its hierarchy. So um, just to say um, that uh, Francoise is, uh, was trained as a political scientist in Berkeley a long time ago, but not so long. <laughs> Sorry to do that. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, in between, so much thing happened. She's done a lot of things. That's what I meant. Uh, so uh, that means that... Um, uh, so Francoise is... Uh, uh, very, uh, I can say that as a friend, uh, she's a, a complex person who has always tried to be in between uh, areas and, 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 and communities and uh, to have to always try to uh, move the boundaries that exist between these, these different uh, realities. That includes uh, between academia and what we call the public sphere, the open uh, public sphere. So Francois is both a scholar and intellectual, but also a civically engaged uh, 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 person, uh, very much uh, in the in the news and in the in France, for instance, where she's working on many uh, issues related to a number of areas that I would uh, you know define as um, feminism. Uh, decolonial, postcolonial engagement, Indian Ocean, and the, what does it mean to be to live and to be from islands? Um, history and, and in, in larger context against uh, history of, of um, uh, exploitation of uh, you know uh, racism, etc. In the south and in the north, and in particularly uh, particular in Europe. 
So it's very difficult to uh, try to describe uh, Francoise's uh, work, but uh, because it's it's very uh, it's very rich and it's always uh, she managed always to I think to to uh, keep uh, freedom from uh, different forms of affiliations and uh, so I, I can mention some institutions in which she's been involved or she's affiliated with, but okay, you know the. Uh, Fondation Mise en Sciences de l'Homme in France, uh, College, College of World Studies, or uh, in uh, Goldsmith in the UK, and so on. So, okay, so this is, I've talked a lot, I've talked enough. Uh, having said that, I would like to ask uh, Francoise uh, to come to the floor and to start our presentation. And again, we are, thank you very much, Francoise, for visiting us. Well, thank you, Philippe, for a very generous introduction and good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to be here because, as Philippe said, I've been, I mean, I do this even building for a while. You know, I've been to Leiden. I discovered Leiden today. So today, the presentation of the, my last book, which was uh, in March this year, is called uh, uh, Programme de Désordre Absolu Décoloniser le Musée. Program of Absolute Disorder, Decolonize the Museum, and which will be out in English next year. So I will present that uh, in, in a way. I will start by saying why, you know, I think it's impossible that decolonization, you know, really sit in this argument. Then I will take an example of one universal museum, which I think is really the prototype and the model and totally imitated in the world, which is Le Louvre which was really the first Universal Museum. And we made, really, the prototype of the Universal Museum. And which I will say also, as an incredible prestigious parenthood, it's a child of the Enlightenment and the child of the French Revolution. No other Universal Museum in Europe has this you know, parenthood. The British Museum, the British Museum, the Prado, do not have this too illustrious parent. And I will explain why it's important and why it, you know, it challenged the question of universalism. And in the third part, I will present two examples of what we, you know, practices, what would be, what do we have to do to imagine the post-museum? What would be the post-museum? That you do have examples around the world, but I will, you know, talk about two things. One example of the museum that I contributed to, uh, you know, to think how it will be, which I call the museum with that object in Reino Island. And the second example, and I will be, I will invite Artic Agua to join me, is something that we did in HAB. So also how, you know, through practices, we learn also how to unlearn to learn, you know, a new. So the first thing, you know, to avoid from the beginning, when I say that the decolonization of the Western Museum, of the Universal Museum is impossible, I do not mean that all the current program toward reparative justice, looking anew at the collection, rewriting history of the museum, working on restitution are worthless, or they are not bringing any change, but they are not the decolonization of the museum. I do not think that one institution can be said to be decolonized if the society around it is not decolonized to begin with. No institution exists in isolation but in a web of social relations, laws, conflicting interests, and, you know, ideology and income tax. I also consider the museum to be a total social institution. So it's not only what is on the wall or what is on the collection, but also who is cleaning, who guards the museum, who cooks, what kind of training the art historian, curators, and staff has received. What is its economy? Is it public? Is it private? Is it both? Or, you know, uh, corporation, private corporation bringing money and what they demand for that, you know, all the art washing that the corporation is doing. Was it the museum, you know, doing confronted with all the issues that, you know, that are around us today, climate disaster, growing inequalities and injustices, you know. So it's not outside of the world. It's not a neutral space for me, not at all. Although it had succeeded in presenting itself as a neutral place. The museum has really succeeded at being, as, you know, apart from the conflict, and so we see. It's also an element of social gentrification, you know, 
it's, you know, and you have struggled, of course, in an institution that offers a story of art and geography of the world that, you know, and, um, and that how stolen, looted, or dissonantly acquire object and human, human remains, of course, right? So campaign for better wage, working condition, again, the, the job that, you know, what guide, intern, employee, transporting, you know, work, young creator, you know, are complaining about, you know, their work condition. Or the rationalization with cleaning, usually with, you know, guarding, you just look, and usually, you know, non-white people doing the job. So this better representation of non-white artists, return of stolen, you know, quiet object, all this is fine, you know, but it will not, again, you know, mean uh, decolonization. But more importantly, my objective is to work to imagine what I have called the post-museum. In other words, what can be built in the 21st century, knowing everything we know about the limit of representation, of the, about the role of the object and the question of material versus material culture, that is, you know, and the question of visual culture. What is it to think about the architecture that will house, you know, object, image, and sound and narrative? Why the model of the architecture of the museum repeat itself all the place, north and south, sensing, you know? What to think of different architecture? How the institution, what will be the new institution we want to build? I mean, we being you know, being people in the global south and in the north. What will the economy will be? Not to be dependent on so many things. We will work there and out, you know. What laws will underpin it? It's about taking a leap of imagination, asking whether element of the universal museum will be gained, you know, and why. Seeing what community museum, ephemeral museum, artist, artist and collective are already proposing and delving once again into anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, feminist, queer and indigenous aesthetics. This does not mean closing the culture. On the contrary, it means opening it up, going beyond the criticism of the existing institution to work on future institution. I do not think also that it's up to the people of the global south or community of color or queer or feminist community in the global north to save the Western Museum. It shall not be their burden. They do not have to wash the blood that is, you know, are in this museum. If they are invited to contribute to clarify what are in the collection, they can say yes or no. But that also means facilitating visa, fellowship, access to collection, archive and document, which is not what's happening right now at all. So, so I could be, you know, I could be asked, but what about the National Museum of the Global South? Can they be decolonized? Many contribute, in fact, to national narrative that exclude a lot of, you know, marginalized community. They are also modern after the Western Museum, and they can be victim of ethno-nationalism, purified narrative, fascism of authoritarianism. They are not protected because they would be from the global south. Again, I defend a post-museum, and that means, you know, imagine new guidelines. What economy, what to preserve, why, for whom, and what is the method of conservation, we talk about it, for whom, about what and how. And then once we have, you know, uh, see what will be the basic guideline, they will be, of course, translated in every this, you know, situation. What can be done in a township in Cape Town will not be necessarily what will be done in Berlin, you know, even in the mountain. But this will be, you know, like what will be the basic guideline that to counter effectively, you know, the universal museum. So this is what I mean by absolute uh, disorder. So, um, after, you know, uh, this, I want to, know, what, what I have developed in that, you know, it also allowed this book, this work, at all my work does, to a lot of collective thinking and practices, and it has multiple sources. It's not, you know, why, or, you know, like something, it's not an academic question for me. What I have learned from my participation in HAB program, Humanity Across Border, with my friend and colleague, Arti and Philippe, and many others in Shanghai, in Dali, in Chennai, Guapati, from also workshop with artists and activists that I do regularly. The last one I did at the Berlin Biennale in Berlin last summer. And finally, you know, for working myself into, you know, what is to visualize narrative. 
Program of absolute disorders taken from Franz Fanon's definition of decolonization that appear on the first page of his chapter on violence in the Reich of the Earth that he wrote in 1961, just before then. And I quote, decolonization, which aims to change the order of the world, is, as we can see, a program of absolute disorder. But it cannot be the result of magical operation, a natural jolt, or an amicable agreement. Fanon, so when Fanon was writing that, you know, he was fooling the war in Algeria, but anyway, a lot of struggle for decolonization, for independence around the world. His understanding of decolonization as absolute disorder, because nothing else could put an end to an order that was a global organization of oppression, dispossession, racism, and exploitation, was widely shared by other theories and leaders of the 1950s, 1960s. And what I mean, I mean as not many, you know, women and men. Disorder was not chaos, but the calling into question of the West, what the West has called the world order. The world, he had sought to maintain through wars and military intervention and through laws, institution and ideology as you know today. My question was then, what does it mean to talk of decolonization today? There is a renewed debate on what it means, as you all know, right? And in a 2022 book, which is called Against Decolonization, Taking African Agency Seriously, philosopher Olufemi Taiwo will reject any use of the notion beyond national liberation is very critical, in fact, of the South American theory of decolonial, you know, it is very. Not only it does not make sense, you right, to talk about decolonization today, but it denies African modernity and reaffirms the racist ideology that African are permanent children. So, you know, that's part of the debate. I'm not going to quote everyone in the debate, but I just want to quote to but in decolonization is not a metaphor if Turk and Kai Wen Yang criticize the white use of the term and they write, I quote, the easy adoption of decolonizing discourse by educational advocacy and scholarship, evidenced by the increasing number of calls to decolonize and what school, decolonizing method, decolonized student thinking, turn decolonization, they say, into a metaphor. To them, and I quote again, decolonization, which we assert, is a distinct project from other civil and human rights-based social justice projects. Is far too often subsumed into the narrative of this project with no regard for our decolonization when something different than this form of justice. And you will see that I agree with them because I said, you know, what is being done in the Western, in some, not in the world, in some Western museum is effectively, you know, a human rights based social justice, but it's not decolonization. So to speak of, uh, speak of decolonization is not today, as a uh, table argue, erasing anti-colonial struggle or the period of independence or the work, you know, that, you know, people have done, but it is, you know, to reflect on what's has changed since 1961. Neoliberal globalization, regional and international reorganization of alliance, concentration of wealth in the Fuan, you know, one person of the world population or over 70 percent of the world wealth. So, and wars and climate disaster. So how do we think about the intertwined effect and their differentiated impact from one aspect to another and how they have consequences? You know, and how that require a rigorous analysis of what's happening from different place and to imagine a strategy. True progress has been made in the field of health and education in the second half of the 20th century. And many people have been lifted of what has been called extreme poverty in the global south. But this advancement has been threatened by austerity policy, privatization of education and health, impossibility of repairing of repaying debt, you know, so that hey, you know, really is a burden for country in the global south was, and more recently even the pandemic. The division between life that matter and life that do not matter have become a major issue, and that division is more visible than ever. And the rise also of fascistic movement and no nationalism far right must be taken into account. And recently, I wrote a, 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 an article or so, but one of the consequences is the inbreathing, you know, that the world has become irrespirable and uninhabitable. 
And it's a li literally, it's not a metaphor again. When I read, you know, during the pandemic, after scientific articles saying that more people are dying of air pollution than of any other cause in the world, it made me think. Or more children are born in the global south with respiratory disease, which make them, of course, you know, more prone to virus and other uh, uh, disease that, you know, are threatening, you know, and, and are, uh, you know, with so a premature death. And also uninhabitable because, as we know, the climate disaster is making the world uninhabitable for many people. You know. So how do we think that? And what will be the place of a museum in there? So the museum, uh, what will be, you know, it's for. So it was always in mind that I look at the Western Museum and not as museum in Asia, South America, or Africa, or Oceania. Already because when we talk about the museum, we are talking about an institution that not only was born in 18th century Europe, but is permanently a Western institution. 61% of establishment are located in Western Europe and North America. 61%. And Western Europe, not even you know, what is called Eastern Europe. 18% in Asia Pacific, 11% in Eastern Europe, 8% in Latin America, 0.8% in Africa, and 0.7% in the Arab state. So we see quite what I see, you know, I see it. So when we see the museum, it's, you know. And Africa and small island developing state account for just 1.5% of the total number of museums worldwide. Also the model, and despite that, the model is still hegemonic. It's it emulated worldwide. What you see, you know, when we look at museums being built in China, the Gulf State, you know, the Pacific, they are looking, you know, a star architect, you know, temporality, a specialty that followed the Western Museum. It has imposed an architecture, in fact, a temporality, method of conservation and preservation that have become so much more so logic that it is almost impossible of imagining otherwise. Yet it has transformed clothes, tapestry, balls, paintings, statues, masks, table, human women into objects. It is a model very difficult to avoid. It has its power of attraction, you know, and it will be, you know, the, and I will be the last person to deny, you know, the, the, that attraction, the visit me, though, I said. But, you know, we are changed, and there are moments, nonetheless, when we visit this museum. And we see the incredible amount of objects from Africa, Asia, the Pacific, America in Western Museum. You feel deeply uneasy. You wonder, you know, what, what, what happened nonetheless? What did that museum? Is it possible that it continued like that? But as I say, it's a little worse And between 1975 and 2012, the number of museums rose by almost 60%. From 22,000 to 95,000. In, in 2021, ICOM, you know, the International uh, of, you know, Museum of the World, counted 100,000 uh, museums in the world. Museums also are either what colonial powers left behind, museums built to celebrate the new nation, national museums with collection of food or objects taken from indigenous community, as in Canada, Brazil, or United States. Museums whose collections were built by looting, contemporary art museum, craft museum, ethnographic museum, museum of science and technology, you know, and, you know, it's, it's really, you know, a vast diversity. We also must consider when we look at the museum, the Bilbao Guggenheim Mystique, you know, saint -Droix. you know, that museum that was built in Bilbao, in the Basque country, a very, you know, working class city, and was clean, gentrified, and that brought tourism and, and and commerce and everything. And everyone wants to imitate that because it works so well. Um, and also museums, like any other institution, are subjected to budget restriction, you know, many, uh, via, via austerity policy, war, you know, what happened in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and Ukraine today, occupation and East Palestine, financialization of art. During the COVID-19 pandemic, 90% of museums worldwide had to close their door. And 10% of them might never reopen UNESCO World Pass. And surprisingly, this 10% museum are in the region where museums are rare and few in number and where structures are still fragile, Africa, Asia, and Arab country. 
In Africa and small island developing states, the injunction to digitalize comes up against the lack of resources. Only 5% of museums there are the means to offer digital content, online content. So we have to, what I mean by that, we have to look really at the concrete, you know, the concrete question, the economy in the sense, not just, you know, what economy calls economy, but what is it, what is the museum, and not just to enter and change what is on the wall. Museums are crime scene. One delicacy, the director of the ISIC of Museum in South Africa said. And to Siraj Rathul, who is a professor of history at the University of the Western Cape, mm -hmm. he said, and I quote, the museum and the world's fair represent not only a public institution of modernity and pacified citizenship, but also the primary institution of, all of colonial empire and coloniality. To explore the crime scene in the European uh, Universal Museum, I look at its origin in the book and at the fascination and passion it unleashed. Because in a single location, it showcased the greatness of nation state, you know, the capacity of bringing, you know, object from all over the world, you know, artistic masterpiece for the pleasure and pride, confirming its place among civilized states. So, you know, it's an ideological tool of domination. And then I look at the Louvre. And uh, the reason I've chosen to focus on Musée du Louvre, as I say, you know, why the British Museum, the number four of the Met or the British Museum here would be, you know, a good example. Because again, as I said, it's so much prestigious. It's the most visited museum in the world. And also, it, it's not sport, spontaneously associated with looting, like, you know, like the Bali Museum or the British Museum. You know, you look at the Louvre, you say, no, not the Louvre. You know, the Louvre is art, right? And uh, so this is what I was uh, interested in. And this is, you know, uh, a quote really, you know, but effectively, uh, you know, uh, what people today, you know, think about the Louvre, are talking about the Louvre. Uh, Pierre Rosenberg was a former director, president of the Louvre. So this is Zidane the Louvre. I mean, very shortly, you know, the, the, the Louvre, in fact, in, 19, uh, in 1692, it was no longer the royal residence. You know, the king was in Versailles. And already, you know, in uh, Louis the 16, has asked, you know, that to create a museum in the Grand Gallery, we have to display the work acquired by the king, but it was to be visited by aristocrats, the king, not by the people. The revolutionary, you know, inherited that collection and in, in 1791 decided to create the Réunion des Monuments des Sciences et des Arts, you know, the Monument to Science and Arts, and adding to the asset of the monarch there, everything that they had taken from the church, from the crown, and all the aristocrats. You know, they say, okay, we say all this, all this has been acquired, on the exploitation of the people, so it belonged to the people. So no compensation, we take it and we put it there. And the museum uh, it was opened in August uh, 1793. So it was a revolutionary gesture, right? Work of art are common property, that was the same. Yet, you know, the unrivaled prestige acquired by Malou in the late 18th and early 19th century was more the result, re sorry, the result of looting by the revolutionary and then the imperial army than this act, this revolutionary act. Second seizure in Belgium, the Netherlands, Prussia, Austria, Germany, Italy, Egypt, and Spain gave the museum, which for a time, you know, uh, an unrivaled position in Europe. No uh, museum had until then, be, you know, had this incredible. This is even how an historian of the Louvre described how it became the global model of the Western Museum. And he said, the museum has become the greatest museum in the universe, never to be equal in human history. The spectacular impression of universalism left such an indelible mark on people's mind that it inaugurated a new way of preserving, exhibiting, and admiring art in a different European country. Little by little, the idea of great museum with a universalist ideal grew and paved the way for the creation of the museum we know today. So this is, a, so I will tell you, you know, how was said was, you know, uh, what we understand, you know. So the Revolutionary National Assembly in the 17, you know, say we will break the chain that held the art captive and confined in other European countries, right? So that was in 18th century. 
Uh, I will can, cannot here give all the detail of that process, but let me quote one Lieutenant, you know, in charge of the military operation in Belgium in 1794, and I quote, for too long, this matter piece has been studied by the appearance of servitude. These immortal works are no longer in a foreign land. They are now deposited in the homeland of art and genius, in the homeland of liberty and all the equality, the French Republic. The cathedral of Antwerp was empty of the ribbons, immediately, you know, loaded on cart to Paris. In the work of the Victoria at Florence in 1794, the revolutionary army continued, you know, to say the work of art and science in Belgium, but also in the Rhine region, you know. And that was very important because, of course, wars have always been looting. But this time was the first time it was made in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity in the name. So this is uh, 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 Napoleon, because so the revolutionary start, army start to, to loot and seize in so Belgium, uh, Netherlands, uh, uh, what is Germany today, and so on. But when Napoleon started, that was really like that it became systematic, huge, you know. And uh, historian Bailey has written, and I quote, that Napoleon March across Europe was accompanied by the plundering of paintings, sculpture, and rare book on a scale approaching that of the British in Asia and Africa. So it started in Europe. The model was in Europe, you know, like already. Building a museum was to loot and to see and to steal and to bring it. And it was to the legitimate place. So that's what you know I wanted to say. The deal, so when Napoleon you know, went to Italy, he took almost 80% of the Venice art treasure. And he stored in every city. It was also the first time that in agreement for the end of war, not only for instance, the, you know, the, the vanquish has to give money as usual, but also has to give work of art and document archive. This was written. And that was the first time we always talking. Okay, and this we, are, we were still in the, under the revolution, we were not yet with the empire. So the director uh, said to Napoleon, and I quote, that time has come with the reign of the fine heart must pass to France to strengthen and embellish that of liberty. So you know the confusion between France and liberty. So they, they also this idea of saving things from people who do not know what they have. Which was, I say, the doctrine after of the colonial empire, you know. So this is, you know, a, a caricature by an English, uh, because the English world, as you know, we are enemies of, of France, mm -hmm. of the how, you know, and Napoleon in the middle and saying to take everything and to pack up everything. And, and some of the painting, huge painting of the Italian Renaissance was cut in pieces because they were too big to carry. Statue were, you know, taken and really, you know, mutilated. It was really planned away, you know, on the, and uh, next one. Um, so this is in Egypt, of course, and also the beginning. So, uh, the part. And next, please. Oh, I have the things, but I don't know where I put it. So, and that the obelisk, you know, that we're in, uh, and how it's taken down by the Napoleon, and now it's in Paris, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, what I see also, so many people come and take pictures of that, mm -hmm. as if it's normal and natural that this is in the middle of Paris. Mm -hmm. So that also how the way art is exhibited may, you know, erase the crime, you know, neutralize. You don't see what you see. You see just the novelist, and you don't see the story of the stealing. So this is uh, also, um, so, uh, and, and the directors say, you know, that this person, people will find consolation in seeing their object in a great nation, which is also the argument today against African people and Asian people asking for the restitution. It's, you know, it's preserved in a beautiful. Let's come to see it, you know, as if it's easy. The revolutionary Boissy Danglars declared, let Paris therefore be the capital of the art, the home of all human knowledge and the repository of all the treasure of the mind. It must be the school of the universe, the metropolis of human science, and exercise over the rest of the world that irresistible empire of learning and knowledge. It is in Paris, without doubt, that we must establish the sacred depository of all human knowledge. 
that we must assemble all of the monument of science and the art, the world of which is so necessary to the perfection and to the study of which alone can form the last degree of public instruction. So the connection with, you know, looting and education and saving for the people. And this is, you know, in fact, in 1788, uh, 1798, sorry, they did like a, a cortege through Paris to show what everything that had been stolen in Italy and lasted for kilometers. People, you know, like a like statue, archive, document, and so on. There is a description that I give in the book and that you, you see when it will be translated, which is what's really like to show the incredible glory. If all this was stolen, you know, stolen or cabin so on, but it was, you know, shown as the glory. And, and this, you know, in 1804, when, uh, when Napoleon, you know, the, the empire fought and uh, they had you know, to return, uh, some, the state asked for the return of some of the objects, England, Dutch, and so on. But they, were, they had so admired what the Louvre has become that they did not claim for everything. They said, no, it's too beautiful. And in fact, they wanted to emulate and to do the same thing. And it became, you know, a lot of historians say it became really where they went back home and they did the same. And what they did, you know, to build the collection was to loot from the colony because they could not loot as much, you know, from the, from the place. But as you know, it lasted in the 19th century with the, 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 uh, the, part, uh, the, the Parthenon phrase, which are seen in the British Museum, and a lot of things were not written, or so even, uh, you know, as I say, um, I don't know the other way. You know, for instance, the Veronese is still in, in the Louvre, the Italian art claim asking for it for, you know, centuries, still in the Louvre. And that it was, in fact, this is a beautiful north of Canada. It was cut in different pieces, you know, to enter to be so on. On top of it, it was damaged, you know, like was done. Like even the statue that you can see in the Asian you know, Museum, the Guimet, uh, in Paris or elsewhere, you know, like statue taken from Angkor or, you know, temple in, in uh, India, whatever, you know, like and left behind. So, no, okay, the other way. <laughs> so, as I say, so uh, not, any, not everything uh, was uh, written. So, and, but when I present the book recently, you know, I'm often asked, you know, why is so much uh, time given to the Louvre, you know, I, when, you know, it's not a colonial thing. Because I argue, it is the mother that preceded everything else, you know, like this was a national museum open to the citizen, to the people. And at the beginning it was free, you didn't have to pay. It was really the prestige of France. It was, the, you know, showing the window for the prestige of France. And, and also, um, you know, in a single place also, I mean, the attraction is that in a single place you find, you know, you can find things from India, East Asia, Africa, Oceania, other part of the planet, you know, it offers the universe. It shows the power of the nation state. You don't see from that you never seen a museum of the global south, side by side, you know, painting from the Italian Renaissance, Islamic treasure, you know, Indian goddesses, Turkish rocks, Chinese ceramics, you don't see that, right? And this, you can see that here. Two, you know, really principle was universalism, European universalism. Everything has to be brought there and through which the world will be studied. And an image will be given to the world, even a time. You know, for instance, you look at something, say, 15th century Iran, for the Iranian, it's not a 15th century, necessarily. So even the temporality is very open temporality, the way, and the object is there, you know, absolutely cut from the environment and become art. And Ariela, uh, Aisha, as they say, art is even a colonial notion. Uh, so universalism, but also uh, um, to be exhaustive. The principle, you know, of, you know, really to be exhaustive became a principle, was already in a uh, Museum of Natural History, as they are called, that you could not have like 10 butterflies, you have to have all the butterflies of the world, you know, you have to have all the plants in the world, and they will be classified and given a Latin name and things like that. And then that will become knowledge, science. That will be the science of botany. That will be the science of geography. And today, in the 21st century, we are still fighting against that. 
So how strong it was, you know. And so the, the fact if some museum, we as you know in the museum, we see usually 10 persons in the collection, you know, no more than that, you know. And so sometimes if you go to the reserve, it, 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 you, you are practically, you know, you have a vertical, you know. I visited the collection at the Averen Museum, the Museum of the Congo in Belgium, or you know, in, in Kevali. And you are you, you you cannot believe, you know, it's not for instance uh, Turban is not, uh, for instance, uh, just um, uh, how say one arrow. It's like you open drawer after drawer, and you see them. It's like, what are you going to do with all that? You're really not sure all of them one day. And what does it mean, you know? Because in fact, it does not mean anything anymore. That besides arrow from Africa, from Congo, doesn't mean anything, you know. And then, as I say, you know, even statue that they were on a temple or you know somewhere in in a, in a village. And people were bringing offering, uh, you know, washing them with milk or, or, or whatever. And they are a piece of stone that become just beautiful, but it's a piece of stone or a piece of wood. And then, as I say, what we have to think for the future institution, what would be conservation and preservation? Conservation and preservation mean also, you know, to uh, become a science and, and they know to do it very well in Europe and they have been trained for centuries. But that means also if it's wood, you know, toxic. It's really because you have to put pesticide and insecticide in the wood, or you know, you have to preserve. It can be preserved. Or you know, everything's under uh, you know, it, it's a lot of questions that we have to ask, you know, rather than saying, oh, we will do like that. Because it's 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 follow. As I was saying, you know, um, I talked with a, 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 a Sami community, and they were they were able to get back a, a sacred uh, tambour. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a sacred drum, and that has been you know in a, a museum in, in Sweden for decades, and they said that three years to bring back the drum in the community because the drum has lost you know it was no longer a drum, it was not. And so, you know, how it's not just, you know, to make the sound sound again, you know, like it does. It's really to, to bring it back and to, so that the drum could be used again in ritual. It could not be just like that. So also the transformation of something into an object that is, that has no, is inanimate, you know, it has no life anymore. And so if we re replicate that, we will do, of course, we will do the one in the museum in the global sense, but they will be like that. We will transform. And, and the, the word even object is, a, is a, I cannot find another word, but I think it's a trap. I think object, but I couldn't find, you know, it, unless you say things. And then the last thing I want to say to the museum before moving to the last part is that also um, a lot of time they have been named uh, grounded. You know, yeah, very often people who know say, no, that's not that, it's something else. There is a case in Kebrani that, uh, you know, uh, this was described as a stool from Niger. And the young woman was thinking, well, that can't be a stool, it does not look like a stool. But she had the means to go to Niger and do, you know, that whole, you know, the investigation and discover, in fact, it was an a, a altar that people were taking from village to village. But that for decades has been described at that. And many of us think, you know, I was talking also with an Indonesian uh, team going through uh, Europe to look at, you know, Indonesian art in different. And they were telling me how they were looking and saying, no, that's not that. Mm -hmm. Or for instance, also a woman from an indigenous community of uh, Brazil, where she was telling me that she went to Cape Verde and she saw things attributed to Guyana that was in fact from North Brazil or vice versa. You know, like. So in fact, the collection, not only, you know, it's a problem of the you know, famous universal, but in fact, collection, we don't know. And many communities don't even know that was, you know, being created by the ancestor or museum. We know the most, uh, you know, scandalous, the Benin bronze, you know, things that were, the, the, you know, what was in Beijing when the British troops and other, you know, looted the, the palace, uh, the solar palace, but a lot of things we don't know. A lot of things, because in fact, you don't have the full, you know. So that's that. So the, the restitution, very quickly, some words before moving to the last one. I mean, in fact, restitution since independence, you know, all country and past, you know, since the 60s, 50s, people, country and past for restitution. It took, you know, it, it has to take until you so long. But already in, 19, in 2018, I'm going to read just a small things, you know. 
a manifesto for the right of access to colonial collections sequestered in Western Europe, you know, written by some African. Intellectual and governmental plantation, they call it plantation, use of plantation. Notion of imperialist progress, monoculture of a neurological discourse, disciplinary closure, you know, the, the, this would be that, you know, this would be that and so on. Scientific taxonomy and racism. Then come the malignity of the European state and in hand with the Universal Museum of the 21st century. Get a visa to come and see your heritage in Paris, Berlin, Brussels, or London, framed by an exclusive and exclusive interior design, an exhibition that had just a few more lines. But there was a long message. But just two more words about restitution. You know, in fact, it's done sometimes with total indifference. The, the Algerian had asked for the return of 24 skulls of our Algerian fighters during the colonial conquest that had been, you know, decapitated and of course brought back to France to study how they were inferior. And in fact, when they arrived, they realized that six of them were really the skulls of, uh, of the fighters. The other was, you know, skulls of the you know, like prisoner or whatever. In a way, you know, I had skull of a chef, you know, but and I can tell you, I, I saw them at the museum. Uh, of natural history in, in, in power and said, like, much like that, you know, like, you know, by luck like that, with them. So, you know, they just took 24, put it in a bag and send it to Nigeria, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. So, also, the insert, you know, it's inserting. Or we recently, also more recently, how also or the condition upon return, upon restitution and repatriation. The bronze of Benin, you know, the Sipsonian Institute, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the German government were ready to bring, you know, to give back. Like thousands, you know, that the British soldiers had plundered in 1897 uh, uh, from Benin City. But then the president of Nigeria, the, the actual said, we're not going to put it in the National Museum. We're going to give it back to the descendant of the ruler because they asked also for it. And they have, you know, they're going to build their own museum. And then the institution, Western institutions say, oh, but then no, we don't give it back. You know, it's a, the thief who imposed its condition to the victim of the set. It's like producing, you know, like, so it's incredible. And so at least, you know, some people in this institution say, but they can give them away, you know, send them, display them, you know, do whatever they want with it. It's not up to you. It's not your business. It's really not your business. And this is a position uh, many of us defend. You give it back, whatever they want to do with it, they will do it. But restitution also, last thing I want to say, the community we do not want restitution. They don't want to deal with the museum. They say, you are safe, we don't want to talk to you. So they are also restitution, we have to be careful. And uh, that makes the book I show, you know, the British Museum say that uh, there is a lot of museum also who present that, you know, to wash away the blood or so. So the last things, you know, I want to talk very quickly in the last uh, five, uh, five, ten minutes. The first would be the museum without object. It was a, pro you know, a project I worked in Reno Island. Ah, is it, sorry, I have good things. God. No, it's the other way. So, you know, um, the, the museum without object, it was like to show, you know, a museum in Reno Island where you have no native population when the French, you know, took it as a colony. And it was to tell the story. And we did not want to say colonial history. So we started from Indian Ocean story because we are in the Indian Ocean. And the fact that Africa and Asia has met for a long time and that you have, you know, you can find uh, China uh, in, in a place or Indian, you know, like incredible, you know, connection trade and, or, and ideas and religion and sounds through the Indian Ocean. So we wanted to say, okay, the Africa Asia world, that was, you know, and the time will be the time produced by the root of migrant, pilgrim, American, settler, slave, you know, and following the circulation of ID, of test and object, and, and so not, you know, uh, not from the colonial history and the story from below, you know, what, what these people thought. And so the uh, object it was also because you have very few objects that will that will tell the story of the enslaved. Like no, you have the object of slavery, the chain, the act of selling, but you don't have the life of the people as if you know. And so in in Europe, as you know, I mean the West, the the object tells a story. You have the object, and then you have the story around. Well. 
But so we say, when we have start from the object, this is what we meant by without the object, when we start for the narrative. And even if we are fragment, you know, little piece, we will, you know, construct something. And we will also talk about the absence. And the absence is not a lack. It's not because it's absent that we don't have history. It's not because we don't have objects that we don't have history. The West is through object. We can also have it through different things, you know. So, and we would borrow from theater, cinema, you know, like to evoke something. So it was that, you know, not start with the object, not follow effectively the Western model. This is what I mean by your practice of imagining what can be a post-museum, you know. And the last, oh, God, I'm making it. So, you know, um, also showing the importance of the body of water, you know, the ocean, the rivers, you know, uh, thinking uh, the Malagashi philosophy say there is a continuum between land and water. And you have that also in the, in, uh, the island of uh, the Pacific, uh, tracing from below um, and opening also to current issue, not just, you know, the past is the past. How the past also, what are the afterlives, as we say, of, uh, of uh, so not the past, but the current afterlife mm -hmm. of slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. The life and the voice of what is our room are called the anonymous, <laughs> you know, and the circulation for us also of sound of music, of poetry, of images that are so important to create also where, to what you belong, who you are, right? And um, the new migration, you know, the Indian Ocean, the new process of realization, that will be also uh, the principle. So that was uh, the building that we blend in the landscape, you know, so paying attention, as I said, to the architecture, not to division between nature and culture, so the, the garden really open where people will be able to plant their own things, so it was not like a park that will be protected. I mean, different things, but I mean, it was never built, right? The French state was the and, and the local conservatives, so it was never built, but the, what I found is the method. Like, what do you, what do you want to do? And the last one, I want to invite Arti to come with me, because it was also important, it was during the HEB program, how do you build a community in two, three days with mostly women coming from different places? This one is Guwahati, the northeast of India. And how then you work also, you, you in, uh, imagine exercise that they will then perform, you know, that will, and it's not the top, we are not telling, oh, do that, this is can be done or how it's done. You will do it. And so we suggest something, and but they have to take it, you know. You want to come? <laughs> so first one sentence was also to have um, the setting of the, of the room in a way that will look like in a house and not in academia. So to put flowers and, and clothes that will evoke, you know, and, uh, um, and so that there were the women also, they were sitting around this big table that were in the center. And, uh, and so that come from all over uh, Assam. How many? Nine, nine, nine. There were 70. 70. Yeah. Some of them are travel at night and so on. So you see the, the table so in a U, so we are around and nobody is really, uh, so you see clothes and flowers everywhere. This was in fact, what was interesting was that uh, the, there were um, scholars uh, from all over uh, Guwahati who had come to discuss a new feminist studies program. And they had never had a grouping of women from the Northeast, from Nagaland and other, to even discuss with them what the issues of these women were. In order, so we invited them so that they could share their ideas of what could be part of their syllabus. Uh, if they were, I mean, a Cotton University in Assam was trying to set up a new program, for feminist uh, uh, studies. And uh, so this was an opportunity for these scholars to meet with these women. And so Francoise and I were very particular that both the scholars and the women whose voices were supposed to be uh, incorporated into the into the curriculum had a dialogue and spent three days together. And we'll be on the same level. That's right. You know, there would be not. So, for instance, so we asked them 
to say where they came from. And rather than, you know, one standing after the other, my name is dad, da, 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 you know, we, we, we gave them a little card upon which we told them to, to describe how they will introduce themselves. To, to a friend. friend. To a friend. friend. So it was beautifully, you know, and so we had uh, Guawati in the middle and they were tracing, you know, where they come, came from. And we had a map of the region and a map of the world. And from the world, so our t shirt so from Chennai and I show from Renew Island, you know, so they, they have a sense of, you know, like it, it's not academic descending from the plane, you know, like whatever, but we came from like uh, real places. So this is at the end, you know, that how, so well, so the map, this is a map of the region and we see in the back and this, you know, tracing from different places. So you see Arti coming from there and me, I'm coming from here, from Renew, you know, and then all the other ones coming from different places of the region. So one said this is a, an example of how they wanted to introduce themselves, you know. And some of them brought picture, a picture. We asked everybody. We asked me some of them, and I'm not some. Yes, you know. One said so. This is how some of them, all those, you know, and some of them said the Lord or the less, and so there was not, a, you know, like a way of doing it, you know, send your bio, you know. And, you know, what makes me alive is food, you know. <laughs> and then the second, I mean, there were also exercises, but we did not show because it does not really image. We asked them to um, list in a day, one day, all the invisible work they had done. Yeah, we, we created an Excel sheet and we put the, the works which is invisible, like cleaning, uh, chopping vegetables, uh, making the bed, or whatever they put. So we, we brainstormed and put down five such ideas. And then we asked each one to put down the number of hours they spent in a week and in a month. And then we discussed it and we shared it. It was a kind of solidarity building exercise, of course, but it was also something that really brought everybody, the scholars, and the, the women who were weavers, who were teachers, who were mothers, who were supporting them, who were peace uh, peace warriors, you know, peace mothers. They have networks for uh, peace in Northeast India. So there were many such women who had come. And so we were able to connect with them on this very simple uh, work issue. And when we, and we talked about, we did the total and we divided how many we were. And we realized that we did like a huge number of invisible work. That was the exercise to show, to visualize what is usually invisibilized. You know, and just that, very simple. And then we had a third, uh, I mean, we had many other things, but that the third exercise was beautiful, absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, so this one, we had nice uh, uh, dry pastels. We love dry pastels with, you know, we had nice A4 size uh, black paper and we gave an exercise. Okay, I dare to think, I dare to dream. And so each one used this prompt as a way to visualize whatever they were daring to think or to dream, including the scholars who were going to be working on this. Uh, so what, I, what, what was important was that we all did this exercise and then we had a nice collage. Uh, we made a huge collage and we shared and we discussed. So you see, I mean, incredible creativity also, rather than standing and also telling us this is what, like really what will be to visualize again, you know, and. Uh, incredible work. And then we put them all together like a, a horse, not one after the other, like in gallery, but all together to create this uh, narrative of, of our togetherness, you know, for uh, that moment. And so they are at the end, all of us, you know, and uh, and in, in the back is, uh, is the painting, I mean, the earth that has been realized, and here what has been done at the beginning. So this was really how to learn to learn, how to bring togetherness, how to build a community, what is to visualize, what is invisible, in which way, not just through the object, but also through different ways. 
So this is, you know, that for me is like the process is an exercise that built the post museum again, you know, and every and different community will do differently. But you know, what is to go through that to unlearn to learn again, you know, and to look differently, to listen differently, to you know, like all to reorganize, you know, to retrain our senses that has been so you know dulled by a school and other and different things. And I think that is the end, right? Yes. So now uh, yeah, five minutes.